Al, how are you? Jerry, it is really nice to see you. Uh, my name is uh, Alex Murray. I'm a commander in the Met. Uh, and I'm also chair of the Society of Evidence Based Policing. And today I'm interviewing Jerry Ratcliffe uh, on Teams because everyone is using video conferencing now in this crazy COVID time. Uh, Jerry is an absolute legend from the policing world and from the applied criminology world. And we just wanted to get your voice out there a bit, Jerry. So I was wondering if you could just introduce yourself and tell us where you are at this time. I'm in Scotland Yard. I'm looking over the Thames. It is a beautiful sunny day, Westminster Bridge ahead of me. Beautiful oak trees lining the Thames and the, the big wheel in the background. Where are you? OK, well, I'm actually at, uh, I, I'm very lucky. I have a weekend, uh, a summer home. It was this or have kids. So uh, I went with this. Uh, my name is Jerry Ratcliffe. I'm a professor of criminal justice at Temple University in Philadelphia. Uh, this is where I'm hiding out during the coronavirus lockdown. Uh, I was going to be in Philadelphia, but if you've seen the news, it's apparently equivalent of the tunnel scene from 28 days later. So I figured I'd hide out here a little bit more. The view's just a, just a little bit uh, better. Uh, I'm a former Metropolitan Police officer from the Metropolitan Police in London. I did 11 years in the Met until I had a mountaineering accident, fell three or 400 feet ice climbing in the Cairngorms, and that was pretty much the end of my career. So I've become an academic. And uh, yeah, most of the time I do academic work, and I'm also the host of the Reducing Crime podcast. So uh, welcome to the eastern shore of Maryland, which today is unfortunately looking like a Scottish summer because I grew up in Glasgow and that's, uh, this is what I'm familiar with. And for the more observant of our viewers, they'll see a pontoon there. And that's your pontoon, isn't it? Uh, for, for something you used to have, you haven't got any longer. Well, I used to have a seaplane and I may have one again in the future. But for now, I, I keep the uh, floating dock for a little bit of uh, kayaking. It's, it's a rough life in academia. Don't let people tell you otherwise. Yeah, so in the old days, um, people used to think that the streets of London were paved with gold if you could only get to London. Now, so if, if any of us decide to emigrate to Washington or Philadelphia, we get a weekend retreat like that and a seaplane. Is that right? Well, I mean, this is, I'm actually about uh, an hour and a half's drive from the centre of Washington, D.C. And whenever I think people say, why do you come back to Britain? I look at this place and think, yeah, if I was in the centre of London and drove an hour and a half, I think I'd still be in Walthamstow by then. So uh, this works out OK. <laughs> Great. Well, um, I, you are a rarity, I think, in the world of academia in the, the, the top of your game. I think you do really apply criminology, i.e. you really care about what happens. You work with police officers. You're not only theoretical. Uh, and you were a police officer. And so... Uh, and you're also a really good speaker and people enjoy hearing from you. So I'd just be interested in your view around, um, I guess, evidence-based policing, because a lot of people call it evidence-based policing. A lot of people say to me, how can I be evidence-based or how do I do evidence-based policing? And I'd just appreciate some reflections from you on if, if you're talking to a police leader now, how should they approach that? Um, OK, so there's a lot to, to unpack in that. We could write a couple of books about evidence-based policing. A couple of the things that I've been uh, certainly thinking about recently are just around the, the issue of solving problems. So I think a great place to start is, well, what are the problems that you have? Um, obviously, working with a number of police departments in the United States, and the ones that worry me the most who are the least receptive to the ideas of evidence-based policing, the ones where they kind of figure they've got all the answers. And they don't really, you know, what are the problems they're trying to deal with? And they don't really kind of feel they have any. They're, they're just working through that. They're, they're stuck in the bunker. So I think there's a lot to be said for fight, just thinking through, OK, take a step back from the front line. Take a step back from the urgency, the drama and the crisis of right now. And think, what are the problems that you're trying to solve? Because once you start thinking about problems, you take the time to kind of think, OK, how am I going to address this issue of recruitment or retention? or violent crime, or property crime, or just a whole range of issues, then you're making space for just opening up the possibility for what's good practice in this area? And what do I want to try and how do I want to address some of those issues? So just, I think the starting point is have a real problem to work on, and then use that as the basis to think about how can you work through a more evidence-based, evidence-driven approach to it. Mm. Um, the, sec the second thing, I've been doing some work with uh, in the past of Philadelphia. I've been working recently with uh, doing some training with Baltimore Police Department, which is uh, about 20 miles that direction, but there's an awfully large body of water 
uh, which is Chesapeake Bay between me and Baltimore, but it's not that far away. The other issue is, I think for researchers and even for police leaders to recognize um, the, the role that experience plays. And, you know, uh, things like the really good book about evidence-based policing by Cynthia Lum and Chris Coper talk about being experienced, being overvalued in policing, and there is something in that. But I think if we're trying to think about how to move evidence-based policing forward, I think we have to recognize that culturally experience it plays a huge role in policing. Uh, and I certainly felt it. I mean, I was a, I was a gadget. I ran away from home at 17 and joined the cadets in London because the circus wasn't in town. And interesting, and don't take this the wrong way, Al, but, you know, I discovered that in terms of leadership, the number of clowns in leadership positions in the circus and policing was about the same. Um, <laughs> and what you end up with... In the old days, of course. Uh, in the old days, back, back, back in the days when the, the first place I worked was actually called a district before we had divisions. I worked on just I had the one letter up here. And who, you, your, and who was your and commissioner? Was, uh, it just started Kenneth Newman. Okay. Yeah, my, my knowledge of previous commissioners is not that good, I'm afraid. No, it's kind of like knowing, you know, who was like the fifth king of England going way back to sort of Ethelred the Unready. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, yeah, that, you know, experience really mattered. I mean, which was a joke, really. I was on the streets at 19 years old after going through cadet and training school. And I had, you know, limited experience. I'm turning up to domestic violence incidents, completely unaware of the research. As a 19-year-old trying to help out, these people had relationships longer than I'd been alive. They measured their relationships in years, what I'd measured my longest relationship in minutes, and that included ordering the pizza. So, you know, this notion that, that we have all this experience, uh, it can be overvalued, and Cynthia Lum and Chris Coper are quite right about that. But I think we also have to recognize that culturally it's a huge part of how policing still functions as a craft of policing. So if we come in as researchers or as we come in as pracademics and we appear to completely negate that, we're pushing back against a lot of internal history, a lot of respect to uh, time served, a lot of res uh, respect that goes to people's experiences. And I think we have to be very careful around that. And the other way to think about it is the culture of experience can be really useful. We have a limited scientific basis to what exists in policing. Um, uh, you know, the uh, medical field, they run over 10,000 randomized trials. I mean, they run tens of thousands of randomized trials on the medical field on absolutely everything uh, that you can pretty much explore within the medical field. And we have a few hundred at most randomized trials in the whole history of policing. We've had policing for 190 years. And Peter Nehru, who I know that you know very well, has, a, has pretty much the only record of all of them that exist. But he can maintain that. It's probably a huge amount of work, but it's still possible to maintain that. And I don't think for the medical field, we would even be able to know where to start, how to, to record all the randomized trials that they have. Not that randomized trials are the be all and end all of experience. But the point I'm trying to make here is that we have a much more limited evidence basis to what we do in policing. So in those gaps, why don't we look at the experiences people have, look at their the experience people and think, what is it you think that we should try doing? And then test that and trial what they think is best. So we're tapping into experience, not just recognizing the value that it has culturally within policing, but also using as it as the foundation for, okay, Let's try that idea. Let's test it. Let's trial it. Let's see if it really plays out. So I, I don't think we put enough uh, recognition to the role, either positively or negatively. Negatively, so it's early morning here. Uh, whiskey's not just for breakfast. Uh, the role that uh, cult the culture of time serve, the culture that experience plays in terms of implementing. Uh, either positively or negatively evidence-based policing. So I think that's important. Thanks. And I think that's why you also applied in your work, because you recognise behaviourally how to operate in the policing world. And it's interesting that you you first mentioned that in actual fact, it's a behavioural approach. Oh, Jerry, we've just lost you temporarily. No, nope, I'm back. There we go. Somebody decided to call me. I don't know why. <laughs> in the morning for that. The, um, in fact, the first 
pre-requirement for being evidence-based was really a, a behavioural approach where you said you needed to be open-minded, uh, except you've got problems and you look for solutions. Uh, and I just want to develop that a bit. So, so firstly, with a bit of organisational humility, you say, uh, I've got a problem. Uh, that might be your rate of robbery, for example, or violence. And accepting that you might not know the cause for that and you might not know the solution to that. And in actual fact, you need to look to find it. And if you can't find it, then apply some sort of testing. And I, I guess for people who are just getting into evidence-based policing, I, I'd like you just to comment on cause and effect. And you've mentioned a randomised control trial in the medical field. Um, I guess we're we're most interested in evidence-based policing about getting to the truth of what's effective. Um, so just talk to me around how we think how you think we can get to cause and effect. Uh, well, I think one of the things that we can't be as purists around the nature of how we do the science around policing. There's a, you know, the, the, the most appropriate research method for any study is the best research method for that particular mm. study. Uh, there are all sorts of techniques. I'm going to go into sort of start to use all sorts of big horrible words like was experimental and time series because that makes everybody switch off the podcast or switch off uh, watching the YouTube video. But where there is a, a t we do recognize um, there's a tendency for randomized control trials to be the, essentially the highest standard of research that's out there along with meta-analyses. But there are many other ways of doing research to explore topics. And that's really very important. Larry Sherman quite uh, aptly put that, you know, the rock bottom kind of standard is do you have a comparison group or a comparison area? And I think that's important to recognize. But we also have to be variable and fluid with our research methods around how we go about exploring um, this kind of work. And it's just especially for difficult for academics to appreciate because we want to do the best research methods possible, the most appropriate science possible, the most robust science. But then we take that to a police leader who works in this incredibly political environment. And that can be politics in whatever country that you're in, big P or small b politics, small p politics, because we can be in different situations in different countries. I know you uh, move between police agencies in the UK and you're finding, I'm sure you're finding the political situation is different in London than it was a little bit further north. Here in the United States, you can move politics in uh, different places within a five minute drive. And we have to, as researchers, appreciate that uh, our police leaders uh, have got, you know, there is this one voice, which is the academic. There is this one voice, which might be their analyst. It might be their intelligence manager. And they're hopefully the, hopefully the voices that are the most objective. But they have to work this in the political environment where they have to work with the community. And the community have a voice and stakeholders and political stakeholders have a voice as well. The mayor who appoints the police commissioner in so many places in the United States has a voice. Or if you're in Florida or some of the other states that have a lot of sheriffs, the sheriffs are elected by the community. And so if we're not cognizant of, especially as researchers coming in from the outside, if we're not cognizant of the politics and the political pressures that chiefs are under, we can be pushing for some kind of academic gold standard that just isn't politically viable. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't be pushing for the best science possible and we should be caveating, you know, you can go and do it this way, chief, but, you know, we're not really going to get to a good answer. But in my experience, just being patient and understanding the political pressures that leaders are under and understanding what their world is like can go a long way to encouraging them to do studies that they initially declined, but just be patient with them, understand their world and help explain to them the value of getting, especially the value for money for the community in returns of their tax, and their tax dollars or their tax pounds in actually discovering whether something really works or not. Because it's not just about taking on new things, we do. We bring more science into policing when we stop doing the things that don't work. Mm. So I guess there's two two perspectives then. So from a researcher coming in, accept that you can't be purist, value experience, and understand the demands and the political environment that the police are working in. And from a police perspective, be open minded. Accept you don't know what's causing the problem all the time or the solutions. But I think also accepting that the police 
are not always the cause of the answers or the cause of the problems. And I think I realized this a bit late on in my career when uh, you hear this all the time still now, well, we police this area and the crime just moved around the corner, or we did this and crime went up and crime went down, uh, which massively overestimates our impact on crime. I think we have an impact on crime. But the cause and effect bit I'm talking about is that as soon as we realize that thousands of things affect crime rate, including policing, then we need to isolate the police behavior that is most effective or the police tactic that's most effective in tackling the problem. Uh, and to do that, you need to isolate it away from all the other factors that are affecting that crime to try and make a difference. Fair yeah, comment? So, so there's a whole bunch of what you just said, uh, you know, the, the, the notion I, I I'm always a little skeptical when people say, you know, come up with some of the things that you said, and I know it's not you saying it, it's, it's what you've heard other people say, oh, we just did this and crime moved around the corner. Um, the, the actual evidence for the displacement of crime isn't particularly strong. There is as much evidence, uh, if not more so, for diffusion of benefits that crime uh, declines in the area in which police do activity, but also declines in surrounding areas. Um, I think a lot of the time it's because offenders who don't do crime in the particular place where the initiative takes place, CCTV or policing or hotspots policing, actually were also committing crime in surrounding areas and they decline in those areas as well. But displacement is very much overrated and I think it's uh, easy to come up with and people just say that as a way to excuse not doing anything. I think the other piece to be cognizant of is that you are absolutely right. Uh, the handbook of uh, crime correlates comes up with over 110 different variables that correlate in some fashion with crime in a consistently reliable way. And police can affect just about none of those. But that doesn't mean that there aren't things that police can do. You know, this idea about being tough on the causes of crime, yeah, that's absolutely great. But um, and that, that I'm mean, yeah, sounding a bit dismissive there. It is great and it's important to do those kinds of things. But in Philadelphia, for example, we have a, a district attorney who said that we won't solve the crime problem until we eradicate pro poverty. And uh, I'm not that much of a fatalist. I think there are lots of things that the that police can do, that the criminal justice system can do. And I think there are certainly efficiency improvements that can be achieved without having to go to this amorphous opportunity to, you know, to try and deal with variables that are far outside the command, the control of the police chief. I think we have to be realistic. If there are over 110 different correlates of crime, we're not gonna be able to affect most of them, but we can be efficient and try to be as effective as we can about the things that we can control. Oh, that's really interesting. I've been reading a bit about complexity lately. Uh, and I think, when you say to a police officer the one thing you need to do is prevent crime and then you look at the correlates as you called it and you go right so what are you going to do to solve poverty uh it becomes an impossible task and so part of our role as police leaders is to make the requirement as as clear and unambiguous as possible within what a police officer can do understanding what partners can do understanding where you add value and doing that and it's, it's from that perspective i'd probably like to bring you into some tactics really uh, and uh, I'm, I'm interested and this is a totally unscripted interview so this is a bit unfair but I'm going to go for your top five um, the, the, the top five evidence-based policing tactics that are sometimes perhaps underrated I also wanted to talk about place and person so how do you operate in a place and I know you've got some great experience of that and how do you operate with people and I probably think more offenders rather than victims and I don't know if we can do that first for violence. Uh, the Commission has made it clear here in London that violence is the number one priority of the Metropolitan Police. But then perhaps moving into other areas as well, whether that's acquisitive crime or, or other perspectives. So what do you think? Place and people and violence, what in your experience and what does the evidence tell us is really effective? Okay, uh, what does the evidence tell us is really effective? Um, firstly, the best evidence is not ask Jerry Ratcliffe, ask somebody who really knows about this kind of stuff. Okay, the second opportunity, I would say, look, policing, uh, if we are going to look at what is possible with policing, what is possible with crime prevention, is um, a whole range of things. But firstly, I would be really um, proximate, as in really up close to the crime event. 
there's kind of proximate crime prevention and then there's distal crime prevention. Uh, uh, distal crime prevention is kind of the term I use. It's a terrible term, I, I grant you. But it's the idea that, well, if we affect this thing, then that will change this thing, that will change this thing, that will change this thing, that will eventually reduce crime. So, you know, we invest uh, millions of dollars in cities like Philadelphia, uh, which is probably the place I know the most about recently, uh, on these long-term distal crime prevention programs. So, for example, if we invest in improved job opportunities for people returning from incarceration, so the chain of mechanisms you're looking for is we want to improve the viability of employability of people coming out of incarceration, which in itself is a good thing to do. But then the sense is, if the process of doing that, we will then reduce their opportunities or reduce their recidivism. Their recid then, so what you end up is that has got to affect that, that has got to affect that, and we have this chain you know, it's like when people say, oh, well, we need to address the underlying causes of the drug markets to stop the violence. And my argument is, no, the drug markets may be a distal cause, and it's always good to tackle drug markets, but why don't we just go straight for the violence? If you're worried about the violence, deal with the violence. You can mm. have drug markets that function in environments that are, have low levels of violence. I am. Um I, I listen religiously to your podcast, Reducing Crime, big plug You're there. Massive. You're an absolute massive. I recommend it to everyone, but uh, you recently reviewed the book by Thomas Apton, spoke to him, uh, and he uses the phrase quite a lot, let's stop the bleeding first. And uh, it's something that stuck with me, actually. And I think distilling what you've said is that. So you can take lots of long-term preventative action, but in fact, let's do what we can to stop the bleeding first uh, from a violence perspective. Well, as you mentioned in the podcast, the Reducing Crime podcast, I'm, uh, I'm legally obliged to suggest to people don't listen to it while you're driving or operating heavy machinery. Uh, but most of the time I, I'm editing out, uh, they are edited podcasts, I'm editing out me sounding stupid, but if people are interested in listening to it, there are about 30 to 35 minute interviews with people who are a damn sight smarter than I am and have a much more useful thing to say. Uh, but Thomas Apps is a really good one. The, the book Bleeding Out is, uh, is a splendid read. And it's a very accessible read, uh, but it is focused on what can be done. It's a, he focuses a lot on the evidence and what we can see. You asked me for five things. Mm. Uh, so I, I think you're going to know a lot of them. Some of them are easy wins. This is, I think, when people talk about getting into evidence-based policing, I think they immediately, that means they have to go off and do some long-winded academic study. Um, and that's really not the case. If I'm a police leader, there are some easy wins that are achievable up front. Um, things that we really know works is really boring, but I know you mentioned this in the introduction to the SEBP conference. I watched that video, which is very good, by the way. Um, hotspots policing. Uh, it's amazing how many places I go to and people I speak to where officers are just assigned to grids, regardless of the volume of calls and where they are and regardless of the crime. Uh, but a lot of cities across the United States still do. We've got one officer in this area, one officer in this area, one officer in this area, one officer in this area. And I say, where is all the crime? They go, it's all in this area. So why aren't you sending, you know, that's where all the crime and the calls are. Well, we have to have one in each sector. Otherwise, you know, apparently, you know, Armageddon happens. Um, the second thing is that uh, we know there's a lot of research around focused deterrence. And focus deterrence I like because there are ways to do it where you can actually combine, start to combine some of these. You asked about places and you asked about people. The more focused policing is, the more effective it is. So we have been working in Philadelphia with uh, smart folk like Kevin Thomas, who heads up research and analysis in Philadelphia Police Department and some of the many excellent officers in Philadelphia. And one of the studies that we did that was headed up on the academic side by my colleague Liz Groff is the Philadelphia Policing Tactics Experiment. It was a follow-on from the Philadelphia Foot Patrol Experiment. And we looked at foot patrol, we looked at the effectiveness of problem oriented policing, and we looked at the effectiveness of an offender focus. But we focused on offenders who were in crime hotspots. So we were looking at the serious repeat offenders who either lived in crime hotspots or were believed or suspected, or there was evidence that they committed crime in those crime hotspots. And the Philadelphia Police Department used everything within their legal means, but they certainly gave those guys, and it's mainly guys, they gave those guys some uh, the love and attention that they deserved and that they'd asked for. And as a result, at the end of the experiment, what we found is that violent crime was down over 40% and violent felonies were down 50% 
in those crime hotspots. So that starts to tell us much more about what's going on in crime hotspots. There are key players in crime hotspots who are taking advantage of opportunities in those areas. So we are, can think about the deterrent side to reduce those opportunities, or and at the same time, we can certainly give those key players the love and attention that they so clearly are asking for and deserve in all the most legal ways possible as a specific deterrence that says, we're on to you. So focused deterrence is one of the ways to do that. So you think about hotspots policing and focused deterrence. All of this is about focusing the crime reduction, the crime prevention, the deterrence, and the focus capacity that police can bring. And can I just uh, can I just come in there, yeah, Joey? Because uh, onto your before you go on to your third area, because uh, I've I've just been reading a great article by Ashley Englefield, John Denley, and Barack Ariel called "I Heard It Through the Grapevine," um, and so they looked at networks of people and then. Uh, picked an individual in that network, again, one visit from one detective to the main individual when they're not in trouble, albeit we knew they were prolific offenders and it was a randomised control trial. And they looked at the deterrent effect of that proactive visit when someone is not in trouble and it had a huge effect uh, of about 20% uh, reduction in their re-arrests. Uh, but not only that, it had an impact on their network uh, because yeah. the individual tells someone else. And uh, I think it's a massively undervalued sort of intervention around uh, effective visits. It affects people's choice architecture. They, they, we like to talk about, don't we? But what's the chance of me getting caught? People think that. And if you've suddenly got a the old bill knocking on your door saying, we know all this about you and we're watching you. And by the way, try and, you know, stick and carrot. Try, uh, it, it if Subliminally or obviously, it sort of makes them think twice about committing crime and it's something we should move on. So just wanted to big up that one. I heard it through the grapevine. Well, and also, uh, what, what is, if you think about what the underlying mechanism of what it's doing is, if you look back in the history of uh, crime, you know, going back hundreds of years in, uh, in, in most places, um, we didn't have huge amounts of crime back when we all lived in small hamlets because everybody knew each other. We started to really see burgeoning crime once we started to develop big cities. What big cities provide is anonymity. OK, you can't commit crime in small villages that much because everybody knows who you are and what you look like. And if you're running around the road with a television set, you know, it's it's a bit like Hamish Macbeth. If you're committing crime in the small t in these small villages, somebody's going to know who it is because everybody knows everybody else. I think so your metaphor is a bit broken, though, isn't it? You didn't really have television sets when you lived in a hamlet. True, but uh, if you've seen Ham Hamish Macbeth, which is one of the best policing series out there, there was TV John who had the first uh, TV in the village, hence he was called TV John. Uh, but we have anonymity. Yeah. The cities provide anonymity. And what the detect in the grapevine, what the detectives are doing is that you've got all these offenders who think that they're sailing under the radar. And the knock on the door is, guess what? We know who you are. You're not sailing under the radar. We've got a lot on you. We know what's going on. We know what you look like. And what the officers are really doing in those circumstances, I think, is that they are taking away the anonymity, that suggestion of anonymity. And it's that anonymity that makes, you know, we think we can get away with it because nobody knows who we are. Uh, and if you think about it, um, Nick Ross, who used to work, present Crime Watch, has a, a nice example of it. He used to talk about how he drives, you know, and he probably to this day probably drives worse when he's in the car on his own and he behaves worse than when his mother's in the car. Because, of course, what you then you don't have anonymity at that point. So that, that story is a really good example that you can. Mm. Good stuff. So focus deterrence, uh, hotspots. What else? Uh, so problem oriented policing. It's incredibly boring. And uh, problem oriented policing, uh, you know, people are bored with it a little bit. I think it's been around for 40 years and people are like, yeah, yeah, I get it. The, the, the SARA model. Um, the, and this is where the shameless plug comes in for the, the book Reducing Crime, A Companion for Police Leaders, because I started to read up and be very aware of the criticisms that the problem oriented policing and SARA model came up with, uh, which is a shame because problem oriented policing is one of the most well evaluated, most effective ways because it's about focused police action and police and partnerships on crime and disorder. Uh, but people seem to be kind of losing enthusiasm for it, which worried me greatly because there's a lot of good research that says that it should be one of the cornerstones of a modern police strategy in any kind of area and place. 
so I wrote the, the book Reducing Crime and Redesigned the Model. Um, and John Eck had a look at that and actually uh, approved. So I've got John Eck's approval for this. Uh, but the Panda model adds a little bit more to it. Uh, the, it's a P-A-N-D-A. Uh, and the process of the Panda model actually adds a little bit more on deployment and the implementation. Because some of the evaluations of problem run to policing were that there were problems around limited uh, implementation. So I've tried to address that. And the other criticism that come up with is that the tendency for police officers to go, you know, I kind of get it. I read about the SARA model in the promotion books, but it all seems a bit kind of vague and academic. Well, you just tell me what you want me to do. So each stage in the Panda model actually has a checklist to go through. And the checklist won't cover everything, but it covers 90% of what people want. So for example, for, to come up with a strategy, the strategy uh, is called VIPER, and VIPER stands for victim support. What, what are we going to come up with for victim support? Because there's a lot of evidence that that impacts on people's perception of the legitimacy of police. I is intelligence gaps. How are we going to fill the intelligence gaps, which is how are we going to add to reduce the, the stuff that we don't know? P covers prevention. E covers what enforcement activities are we going to do? And a big one, I know in British policing, the R covers reassurance. So the broader community reassurance, who get very worried about signal crimes, about other things taking place. So problem-oriented policing, I think, is key, but there are lots of different ways to do it. I use the Panda model, and people can read about that in the, the book Reducing Crime, the Companion for Police Leaders, and the simple checklists that are associated with each stage. But as long as we're doing some form of problem-oriented policing, I think that has to be uh, a, a keystone part, a cornerstone at least, of any kind of uh, area command policing strategy. And just uh, one or two panda for us. Uh, P is the problem scan. So people who are aware of SARA will be familiar with that. A is to analyze the problem. N is to nominate a strategy. Uh, so many times I see people coming up with different kind of vague or changing the strategies as you go. That's why we have Viper which is, you know, it's been through victim support, intelligence gaps. Uh, what is your strategy to come up with something for prevention, enforcement, and reassurance? Uh, so that's the end, nominate the strategy. D is actually a process of deployment. Uh, we don't do a great job in training mid-level commanders. And so helping them come up with a strategy and how to deploy, it, how to deploy that strategy, I think is really important. It's been a, a little bit of a weakness in, in problem oriented policing to date. And then finally, the A is assess the outcomes. Did we actually achieve the goal that we're looking for? Um, and it's really geared towards mid-level. So sergeant right the way up through, might be to superintendent level. Um, you could have it in the, in the US, it would be, it could be up to you know, deputy chief or up to major, depending on you know, how you structure the ranks in the police department. But it's, it's a little bit of a reflection of that, the, the middle forgotten leaders in policing at the front end we have the academy which is great training for you know don't get the police department sued we'll cover the basics don't make false arrests and don't drive and drive carefully don't shoot the wrong person and don't make false arrests so a lot of that is covering the police department's backside and then at the other end of the career when you reach the top level there are great symposiums and iacp and you can go to these seminars it's all great but the people who do so much of the work are in the middle and that's from the ranks of sergeant right the way up, as I say, up to almost deputy chief. And they get bugger all, it seems. It's yeah. kind of like pass a, <clears throat> pass a test, read a book, and come in on Monday in a different colored shirt. And I think, mean, hold on a minute. We're giving these people uh, all this incredible responsibility for being essentially the buck stop for crime in geographic areas of cities with populations of tens of thousands of people. And it's, did you pass a test, do a quick board and read a book? I think we have to get them more than that. Yeah, that is uh, a profoundly true and something we should all reflect on. And um, it's always interesting, isn't it? The, there seems to be an understanding that rank relates to knowledge around what's effective. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm not sure that's entirely right. And the other thing you said there that made me just reflect is that sometimes people think evidence-based policing is all about innovation uh, and yeah it, it, it can be a really good way of testing what's new and what's effective but the three areas you've just spoken around around focus deterrence problem solving and hotspots are stuff that's been around for a long time uh, but we just say we do it but we don't really do it um, I think it was an ex-commissioner assistant commissioner here from 
the Met who said there's three reasons why we don't engage in police tactics that other people do that is effective. And that's one is we say, yes, we do it already. The other one is, yeah, we tried it here and it didn't work. And the third one is, of course, it's different here. Yeah. Uh, and and those three excuses are used more the larger the police force you operate in, I think, probably because of a bit of organisational arrogance. And of course, that doesn't refer to the Met in any way whatsoever. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and, it, and it makes me also then reflect on the second T of Sherman's triple T. And I know we don't want to play acronym bingo, but he talks about evidence based policing being about uh, targeting, tracking and testing. So a bit like hotspots, you target on the most offenders, the most uh, the largest hotspots, you test what's effective with whatever the best research method is. But the middle T, the tracking bit, is always undergunned, I think, in policing, which is, so what activity are your staff actually engaged in? Because they say they're doing hotspots, or they say they're doing focused deterrence, or they, we say we're problem solving. Well, actually, are they? And having the ability to actually understand the activity that your staff are engaged in is a key of being evidence-based. And it's, we are uh, we slightly over obsess on outcomes. You know, everyone says, well, we need to measure outcomes, not outputs. And in actual fact, perhaps we do need to measure the outputs and not the outcomes <laughs> because yeah. our, act our activity is the most important thing we do. And yes, we can measure crime rates and all these other things, but are our staff doing what we know is effective? Uh, and, and that we, we, had a, we had a couple of experiences of that here in Philadelphia when we ran the Philadelphia foot patrol experiment. We use rookies, and I know you know this research, but for, for the benefit of folk watching or listening, oh, think, yeah. we use, uh, I mean, really enthusiastic, shiny new cops straight out. We opened up a box and we found a couple of hundred brand new police officers, put them on the street. And on the whole, they were great. We spend a lot of time. I, I think it's hugely important for academics to spend as much time as possible in the field. So uh, I know me and my colleagues and I spent a lot of time on foot patrol with the officers, observing what they were doing, seeing how it was really implemented. And they were great. They were young and they were enthusiastic and they were keen and they were out there working. And they were really good at filling in paperwork as well. So that was great in terms of uh, keeping an eye, doing some of that tracking. A year later, when we did uh, the Philadelphia... So what was the result of that? Jerry? Uh, so the, the result of the Philadelphia foot patrol experiment was that after three months... Uh, compared to comparison areas, we had exactly the same. We had 120 violent crime hotspots in Philadelphia. We randomly selected 60. We put foot patrol officers on six on those 60 uh, violent crime areas okay. for uh, five days a week for 16 hours a day. And at the end of the summer, compared to the comparison areas, violent crime was down 23%. Now, we did a similar thing the year later at the Philadelphia Policing Tactics Experiment, which was headed up by Liz Groff and Nola Joyce with uh, Chuck Ramsey as the police commissioner again. Uh, but that time we did the foot patrol slightly different. We used larger areas, we had fewer officers, and the officers were veterans. They had a few years under their belt, they knew the system, they knew, you know, questions about how much supervision and how much leadership that they were given. Uh, very different than when we used the, the new shiny officers. And what we discovered is that that really wasn't effective. So we went back to look at, we did the tracking, as you're saying, what is it that the officers were actually doing? In the second experiment that we didn't get a reduction in violent crime, what we actually found is the officers weren't, compared to the control areas, weren't really doing that, many, that much more work. A few more traffic stops, a few more drug arrests, but nothing really substantial. We went back to look at the first experiment and what we saw that the young officers, compared to the control areas, it increased the number of field investigations or pedestrian stops or uh, however you want to use the term. They were stopping and speaking to people. That went up 64%. So it's not necessarily a popular story with people, uh, especially in the United States, who would like to see police roll back on stop and frisk, on pedestrian stops, on field investigations. But when it's targeted and it's uh, legal and it's to the right people who are the hot people in the hot places at the hot times, uh, there's evidence from the Philadelphia foot patrol experiment that it really can be effective as a deterrent in reducing crime. So mm. that tracking is really important because it helps us understand the results we see. I can see an outcome. You know, and it's, as I say to people, whenever we run experiments uh, or we do any kinds of studies here, take a good Take a good note of what it is your officers are actually doing. If you find that you didn't reduce crime, nobody's going to care. But if you find that you actually did reduce crime, all the police chiefs are going to come in to you and say, hey, what did you do? And if you don't know what you did, that really isn't very helpful. So it's, tracking is really important. 
Yeah, and it makes me reflect on, on the current recruitment issues we've got in the UK at the moment, where we're quickly recruiting 20,000 extra cops. And there's a real concern around the levels of inexperience that they're going to be as there's a big cliff edge and people retiring. But And it's seen as a, a very bad thing, but you've just put a silver lining around it uh, that, in actual fact, inexperience can sometimes be a, a, a good thing. <laughs> Well, yeah, and, but, and here's also where I think the value of evidence-based policing in this environment, if you've got a bunch of shiny new cops, we might as well give them the best information and knowledge about how to uh, address some of the problems they're going to, inc they're going to encounter. If we are a business, and, uh, you know, professions have an evidence base, jobs just rely on experience. So it, that, that you really hit on the issue there, which is if we want to get these guys a head start in getting that experience, Let's start them off with some policies and practice that we've got from the existing evidence base that is at least not best practice, we're always trying to achieve better, but at least good practice. Let's start them off by not making mistakes. Mm. And so that's a good, good place for, to use the evidence base, the existing evidence base as much as possible in the training and the teaching that these, uh, these guys get when, before they hit the streets. Yeah. Is there, is there a, 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 a final sort of tactic you would uh, ask everyone to look at? You've, you've described eloquently three or four. Um, let, I would go with the idea of having an offender management plan. Um, so I talk about the, the, the future, and this is really based on my conversations. When, when we're not in the coronavirus lockdown, I get to travel quite a bit, which is really great and uh, spend a lot of time with police around the world. And they have different problems in different places. But there are surprisingly a lot of similarities. And, you know, the future of policing looks to be harm focused, intelligence led, problem oriented and evidence based. And I combine all of those to think about how do we have an offender management plan? We can talk about locking down places. We can do foot patrols in those areas. We can increase patrol. We can put CCTV. We're, we're quite good at understanding place. How to deal with uh, serious repeat offenders or groups and clusters of offenders? Not so much. And I think having an offender management plan is a good way for police to work with partners in other uh, agencies of government and the community. Not everybody needs a custodial sentence. There are people who are on the verge of emerging into criminal lifestyles that could certainly be diverted or deflected. There are people who are in lifestyles, uh, uh, criminal lifestyles, that we can think about what is it the best goal we want to achieve. And that's not necessarily in terms of a very kind of naive perspective of justice, but the goal we want is for them to commit less crime and be less harmful to the community. And then there are the hardcore, there are the serious repeats, there are the 6% of people that commit 60% of the crime. And yeah, that's what, how are we going to lock them up as quickly as possible for as long as possible? Um, there are certain people in our society that, yeah, we really, we, we're not going to miss them that much if they get incarcerated. But the idea of having a standard management plan for absolutely everybody in our society is, I think, preposterous. And it negates bringing in other tools that could be effective deterrence or crime reduction capacities. So having a nuanced, sensible, evidence-based crime reduction, crime offender management strategy that's geared towards redu reducing the harm on the community, even if that means that we arrest fewer people, the goal is not to increase, have the most arrests by the end of the year. The goal is to have the least harm affecting our communities. And so I think that's a core of a mature offender management plan. Mm. So I'm going to summarise what you said there. We spoke a bit about what evidence-based policing is. Make it sound is. better, would you? Could you do that? Can you just make yeah? It well, I'm going to do it in 30 seconds, and then I can just tell everyone to fast forward to the end. But it is, uh, <laughs> uh, it is focused deterrence, hot spots, uh, problem oriented policing, and having an offender management plan. You know, if you're going to hang your tactics as a mid-ranking police leader in charge of an area, you know, following those four areas is is probably not a bad place to start. And there are places. That, all across the internet and internet where you can find out more. Um, so, Jerry, finally to you, can, if, if people want to go to stuff to find out more, can you just highlight some of the areas and then finish with just a couple of sentences on your book and on your podcast? Sure. Okay. So some of the stuff that I've been talking about, uh, certainly the Philadelphia 
uh, foot patrol experiment. And if people want to learn about the most recent work we've done on the Philadelphia predictive policing experiment that was run, headed up by the Philadelphia Police Department, and I was fortunate enough to help do the evaluation of, people are welcome to visit my personal website, which is jratcliffe, J-R-A-T-C-L-I-F-F-E dot net. You click on projects and some details of the, the, the work are there. And it's relatively uh, simple pages to read. There's not a lot of high academic stuff in it because I don't do that kind of stuff. Two or three page PDFs that people can download. Uh, the book is Reducing Crime, a Companion for Police Leaders. Uh, I think it's about 18 quid or 30 bucks US. Um, it's not that expensive because I know that people don't like to spend money on books and policing. Uh, the, the associated website is reducingcrime.com. Uh, the websites that I like to go to for evidence, each, each chapter of the book, by the way, is supported by a page on reducingcrime.com. If people come to the chapter 10 page, you, I list the five websites that I always recommend people go to if they want to explore the existing evidence base for any of the problems that they have. They're welcome to come along to that. If you're not thoroughly pissed off with listening to me rad on meaninglessly uh, to you on, on this uh, uh, podcast or this episode on this YouTube, where are you putting this out? I don't know. I, the way society seems to be falling to police is I'm, I'm expecting to get a USB drive on a, a, a ride by Raven or something. Uh, people can listen to uh, the Reducing Crime podcast. It's about 30 to 35 minute interviews with people who are a damn sight smarter than I am. Uh, they're released about once a month. The next one that's uh, coming out in the next few days next week is going to be with Mo McGough on women in policing. Uh, you can get them on iTunes. I release them on SoundCloud, but you don't have to get them on SoundCloud. Uh, they're also available on iTunes, Stitcher, and just about any place that is, has discerning smart podcasts. And yeah, with a bit of luck, when the coronavirus eventually dissipates in some fashion, and we can all start traveling again, hopefully I'll be able to catch up with people at conferences as well. That's great. And uh, I'd like to big up the UK College of Policing website around what works. They've got some great graphics and a lot of information around what's effective and what is not effective. Uh, yeah, that, that's one of the five that I mentioned. So there's there's that. There's the Centre for Problem Oriented Policing website. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, there's the What Works, uh, the Crime Reduction website for National Institute of Justice. There's Cynthia Lum's Hotspot Matrix. And there's one other which eludes my memory right at this point, but that's the issue with doing live recordings of podcasts. Global Policing Database, Queensland? No, not no, that one. But there you go, you just picked it up. So good on you. <laughs> good stuff. Joe, really grateful for taking your time. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, I know you're a very busy man. Um, folks, this is a, a YouTube video from the Society of Evidence Based Policing. Wishing everybody well in this tricky period. I hope you all stay safe. Thank you very much.